A very good evening and warm welcome everyone. I, Dr. Ritika Dhiman, on behalf of Voice of Healthcare, welcomes all the speakers and the viewers who have joined in for today's discussion. Voice of Healthcare, along with our Powered by partner, Merck, has taken an initiative to bring together the expert and speakers to recognize Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month. In this panel discussion, we are privileged to have a group of experts who will share their knowledge and experience in the diagnosis, treatment, and management of head and neck cancer. We will explore different aspects of this disease, such as risk factors, early detection, treatment option. We will also discuss the impact of head and neck cancer on patients' quality of life and the importance of a comprehensive support system. So without further ado, Let's get started with the introduction of our esteemed panelists. I welcome Dr. S.G. Ramanan, Director, Madras Cancer Care Foundation, Founder Trustee of Cancer Research and Relief Trust, Founder Trustee of Can Care Foundation Advisor, Tanjavur Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Ramanan. Uh, your voice is, we are not able to hear you, Dr. Ramanan. Uh, you have to, I think, increase your uh, volume. Or you have to give access to the mic. I welcome Dr. Prasad Narayanan, Senior Consultant, Medical Oncologist at Cytocare Hospital, Bangalore. Welcome, Dr. Narayanan. Thank you and good evening to all. Dr. Jyoti Vadhva, Vice Chairperson and Head Medical Oncology and Hematology, Paris Health. Welcome, Dr. Vadhva. You're, you are on mute, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ritika, and good evening to the audience. Dr. Rakesh Reddy Boya, Senior Consultant, Medical and Hemato Oncology, BMT Physician, Coordinator, Medical Oncology, Apollo Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Ritika, and good evening, all. Ms. Urushi Prasad, Director, Office of Vice Chairman, Niti Ayog. Welcome, Ms. Urushi. Uh, I think uh, she will join us in a bit. So starting with our discussion, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Ramanan, uh, sir, uh, what is head and neck cancer? How common are they? And what is the burden of it in India? Uh, we are not able to hear you, sir. I think uh, um, you should. Uh, I think there is some uh, issue with the mic. Sir, I would request you to uh, rejoin this. I think uh, you have to give access to mic. So once uh, Dr. Ramanan uh, rejoins, uh, I'll move on to uh, my next question to Dr. Vadva. Um, and what are the main types of head and neck cancer? Uh, what are the sim and what are the symptoms of this type of cancer? So see, the types of head and neck cancer would depend on how we classify. So if we base it on the part from where they arise, uh, they could be of different types, say cancer of the oral cavity, if they are arising from these lips, gums, mouth, tongue, uh, the inside of the cheeks. Uh, it would be called as oropharyngeal cancer if it arises from the tonsillar area. 
it would be called as laryngeal cancer if it arises from the voice box or hypopharyngeal area if it arises from the hypopharynx or the gullet it would be labeled as nasopharyngeal cancer if it arises from the upper part of the throat behind the nose nasal cavity cancer or paranasal sinusis cancer if it arises from that area or salivary gland cancer if it arises from the salivary glands however there could be another way to type the head and neck cancers based on the type of cancer cells which the pathologist sees under the microscope so the most common such type is squamous cell carcinoma the other type could be adenocarcinoma or sarcoma or even melanoma and the last way to classify it into different types could be whether it's related to the infection with human papilloma virus or not because we have learned over the years with research that the head and neck cancers which are hpv or human papilloma virus related behave in a bit different fashion so that's how we uh, you know uh, say the different types of head and neck cancer Uh, thank you so much uh, dr madhav for uh, you know concisely um, um, fig, uh, you know telling us uh, how different type of head and neck cancer occur uh, so uh, coming back to dr ramnan uh, sir yes yes now we can hear you perfectly yeah so <laughs> thank you so much sir uh, so uh, what Begin, is head and neck cancer sir yeah uh, and how are uh, uh, you know how common are they and what is the burden of head and neck cancer in india okay basically uh, for the general population cancer which arises either in the nose mouth or ear or from the thyroid gland would be called as head and neck cancer so these areas for example the mouth what we say mouth will include the lip well the oral cavity the cheek you know tongue the gingiva the gums tonsil upper airways and also the upper digestive tract all of them are lined by a layer of mucosa and this lining uh, generally is made up of a particular type of cell called as squamous cell and rarely by some other type of cells also so this general cancer arising in this lining uh, commonly called as squamous cell carcinoma uh, these are called as the head and neck cancer so squamous cell carcinomas arising from all these areas in the mouth area ear area and the nasal area the burden obviously is significant globally and also in our own country Uh, if we see that in our country in all the registries which are population based and hospital based in the men it will be always in the top 5 particularly when we add all the sites of disease it will always be in the top 5 in the women it may rank around 7th or 8 uh, and in some registries it will rank in top 5 even in women so and rightfully our country is also known as the capital of head and neck cancer overall in some publications to put it very dramatically we may say in men of all cancers 25 to 30% will be head and neck cancer and in women at least 10% of all cancers could be head and neck thank you so much uh, dr ramnan for us uh, answering that question uh, when uh, i myself i am a dentist and when i was uh, you know doing my uh, third year and final year so i was also told that you know this is the top 5 cancer that exist in men in india currently so it's a huge there is there is a huge burden of uh, head and neck cancer in india and uh, you have rightly pointed out that um, Uh, moving on to dr prasad uh, so what are the common uh, most common risk factors associated with the, uh, this type of cancer and uh, as uh, so dr ramnan has already told that it is more common in males uh, than females so so what are the risk factor and why is that a difference uh, between the male and female right so we heard from dr ramnan and dr jyoti that this is a, a group of uh, cancers which are put together in one basket known as head and neck cancer right so when we talk <clears throat> about head and neck uh, cancer in general i think uh, 
the most common is this squamous cell cancer as dr ramanan said so that if you take all, uh, if you take 100 head and neck cancers which come 85% will be the head and neck squamous cell carcinoma which we see and there the most common cause is tobacco tobacco in any form it could be the tobacco smoke smoking or smokeless tobacco or chewing and uh, any form of tobacco consumption is the most common cause of uh, head and neck uh, squamous cell carcinoma and we can say that uh, 75 percentage of the cancers in head and neck are uh, related to lifestyle and smoking and alcohol alcohol also is a very important risk factor in developing head and neck cancer in many of the studies of risk factor identification uh, almost 80 to 90 percent of the patients with head and neck cancers have exposure to tobacco or alcohol or both actually and alcohol actually increases the effect of uh, tobacco and increases the risk factor so these two are the most common uh, risk factors there are other risk factors dr jyoti mentioned about the human papilloma virus uh, as one of the risk factors there is epstein barr virus also which also can cause some of the cancers in the head and neck region then there are some head and neck cancers which occur due to genetic susceptibility immune suppression radiation but these all put together form a minuscule of the total percentage so a large percentage for all practical purposes we can say this is a lifestyle disease and and as dr ramanan said it heads most of the leads most of the cancer registries and males among males it is the it is among the most common cancers and why it doesn't uh, happen much in females one reason majority of the reason is because of the lifestyle itself but now it is changing we are seeing many uh, females who come with the tobacco exposure mainly the the in in the, the chewing habit actually is much more in females so we see many of the patients who have submucous fibrosis which occurs because of chewing who develop head and neck cancer later so i would not say that it is uncommon among females but uh, we can say that breast and cervix are much more commoner than head and neck cancer in females Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Narayanan, for uh, you know categorize, uh, categorizing uh, the risk factors. So uh, there are viruses that is there, uh, Epstein-Barr and HPV viruses, uh, as uh, told by Dr. Vadva. And apart from that, the lifestyle that is the alcohol and uh, you know tobacco uh, is there. Uh, so uh, so moving on to the treatment part of it, uh, uh, Dr. Raman. Uh, so. How is head and neck cancer typically treated, and what are the goals of the treatment? The question is for me. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, the treatment of head and neck cancer is very much dependent upon what is the stage of the disease and what is the comorbidities the patient is carrying, and sometimes. Uh, individual's preference, the patient preference also will become important. Broadly, we should say that if it is early cancer, stage 1 and stage 2 cancer, we should try as much to treat with one modality of treatment, which could either be surgery or radiation. Once we go to stage 3, 4, always it is a combined modality treatment where surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, all will be employed. And in a simple way to tell to the general population, if it is in the front part of the head and neck, that is, uh, you know, it is in front of the tonsil, that is oral cavity, cheek, tongue, gums, etc. As much as possible, we are going to do surgery as the primary modality. As much behind we go, for example, the pharynx, the upper airway, the voice, voice box, uh, larynx. In that area, we would uh, predominantly treat with radiation. So this is how we would uh, try to classify in a simple way. But all of us in the medical field know the complexity of this treatment. 
thank you so much uh, dr ramnan for uh, you know uh, classifying that uh, in a very simple manner uh, the type of treatment that we do for uh, head and neck cancer and uh, we have uh, now discussed about the treatment option moving on to the diagnosis uh, dr reddy how are head and neck cancer diagnosed and what are the different stages and can a head neck head and neck cancer spread to other parts of the body as well yeah uh thank you for the question dr ritika i hope you can hear me clearly yes yes sir we are able to hear yeah you. so yeah. yes uh, for any cancer uh, uh, similar uh, to any other cancer head and neck cancer the primary diagnosis will be by biopsy biopsy will uh, entail removing a small part of the tumor and uh, subjecting it to uh, a test under microscope to understand as uh, the previous speakers have already told us that squamous cell carcinoma is the most predominant variant uh, we will get to know that uh, under a biopsy uh, after a biopsy how we do the biopsy depends upon where the primary tumor is located like uh, uh, if it is located on uh, uh, on the inside of the cheek or on the tongue the front half of the tongue or anywhere on the jaw or on the lips it is easier uh, it's a biopsy done under direct vision a small punch biopsy a small part of the tumor is removed and it is subjected to uh, histopathological examination and a biopsy report gets released uh, if it is the head and neck cancer is in the deeper locations like in the posterior part of the tongue or on the voice box or on the uh, posterior aspect of the throat then uh, we typically do a small uh, endoscopic procedure called uh, dldp uh, wherein a in small scope is passed into the throat of the patient and the biopsy is removed from the mass residing deep inside the throat throat and a direct vision and then the same histopathological examination is done once this biopsy test is done we then need to stage the disease like to understand where all the disease has spread now here we have to understand uh, the difference between head and neck cancer and rest of the other cancers is that uh, a head and neck cancer typically spreads loco regionally like uh, it spreads to the surrounding structures and in, uh, to the lymph nodes more commonly then spreading to other organs in the body like say uh, spreading into the lungs or liver or uh, bones so uh, the local uh, the staging examination the staging investigations typically would involve doing a ct scan of the oral cavity and the neck so, uh, if you do this much examination in a research, uh, evaluation in a research consent uh, resource constrained setting then this is enough suppose if you are uh, doing it for a person who has Uh, no dearth of resources then probably we will do a pet ct examination of the whole body to understand if it has spread to other organs of the body coming to the last part of the question whether it can spread to other organs of the body uh, yes it can it, uh, it can indeed spread but as i said prior um, you know, the local regional spread is more common and more consistently this is how um, we will uh, see a head and neck cancer presenting with it can uh, indeed spread uh, spread to lungs and it can spread to liv uh, liver and uh, bones as well but these are rarities uh, so on basis of these investigations that is the biopsy as well as the ct scan plus or minus a pet scan we stage the disease like uh, stage 1 2 3 and 4 so easier to understand the logical sense stage 1 is an early stage disease stage 4 is a very advanced disease stage 2 is uh, is little more advanced than stage 1 stage 3 is where we have disease in the spread to the lymph nodes stage 4 is uh, the disease is rogue originally very spread or it has spread to some other organs in body like lungs or bones or liver etc so this is how we will diagnose and stage head and neck cancer thank you so much uh, dr reddy for elaborating the stages uh, and the diagnostic part of it so uh, typically a histopathological report is the definitive uh, uh, you know a uh, definitive uh, diagnosis of uh, what a head and neck cancer uh, uh, looks like and uh, moving on to uh, apart from the medical part of it i would like to move on uh, to the government um, initiatives that are done so miss uh, urvashi uh, ma'am what are the specific initiative uh, or programs aimed at reducing the incidence of head and neck cancer uh, in high risk populations in india yeah so um, you know programs are at uh, you know different levels uh, starting right from prevention uh, to you know screening uh, detection and then of course treatment 
um but the major thrust really uh, you know from a public health point of view and a health policy point of view um has to be and and in recent years we've seen that shift uh, towards prevention and uh, early uh, detection um because uh, you know we simply cannot afford to uh, diagnose everybody at much later stages which is what tends to happen uh, currently uh when the disease is also more difficult to treat it's more expensive to treat um and the whole burden you know on the health system as well as is, is much more significant so we have to try and uh, prevent as many uh, cases as we can and in those we cannot uh, prevent our attempt has to be to at least detect it as early as possible uh, so you know some of the efforts in this uh, context uh, one is of course Uh, you know as everyone has mentioned that um, tobacco is is actually one of the biggest uh, risk factors uh, you know smoking tobacco as well as smokeless uh, tobacco products uh, so there are a number of initiatives which are actually aimed at uh, adolescents and youth um, where the objective is to try and uh, reduce uh, you know or prevent uh, addiction to these substances or even use of these substances Uh, so that is uh, you know one part of the focus uh, and a lot of these are um, based in schools or or colleges or even elsewhere uh, there are these awareness uh, programs which are being uh, conducted uh, the other a uh, big shift in the last few years has been uh, in primary healthcare uh, whereas you know our primary healthcare system earlier has always focused on um reproductive maternal and and child health uh, the shift that we have tried to bring about and and we are trying to bring about is a shift to comprehensive primary health care where screening uh, of common cancers uh, which also includes oral cancers uh, is going to be a part of the health and wellness centers uh, which are being set up under ayushman bharat uh, so the idea here is that not only will we do awareness creation through these platforms Uh, not only will we try to uh, address this risk factor of tobacco uh, use and tobacco consumption but we will also offer uh, early uh, screening and detection uh, to the population so that is the idea of these health and wellness centers which are which are now being set up there are about uh, 150000 of these centers across the country now but the idea is to operationalize them fully uh, so that they are actually capable of conducting uh, screening Uh, and an early uh, detection early diagnosis for these uh, types of cancer so that is really the other uh, big shift um, of course on the treatment side uh, we do have uh, insurance programs which are being uh, introduced which have been introduced now uh, the con- continuous challenge there is that especially when it comes to cancer uh, there are many new therapies you know that constantly get added uh, especially if we look at immunotherapies and others Uh, so that is really the next kind of uh, level for us is to try and uh, ensure that we can include uh, as many of these therapies in these uh, insurance programs so that uh, even the average citizen the, the poor person can actually have access to these so that is really the the next sort of uh, hurdle that we need to cross uh, with a lot of the insurance programs um and and just uh, you know finally a, a quick word on uh, hpv uh, of course you know as as we've said that's perhaps not the biggest uh, cause in this case it's it's a much bigger uh, factor when it comes to cervical uh, cancers uh, but definitely even on hpv you know as we're aware um, th- there is a, a, a domestic program which has now been started it is being rolled out in phases across states uh, using an indigenous uh, vaccine so definitely that is something which will uh, eventually help as far as prevention is concerned of course not just of you know uh, oral uh, cancers but uh, more importantly in this case of cervical cancers and and others so that is also of course another uh, initiative which is being undertaken on the uh, preventive side thank you so much uh, ms urvashi you have rightly mentioned that prevention and awareness 
uh, are the main part and focus uh, uh, right now. And apart from that, early detection is also uh, into the uh, limelight. We have to do mass detections of uh, uh, these type of cancer at an early stage so that, uh, you know, uh, we can improve the patient's life uh, throughout uh, the cancer treatment. And apart from that, you have also mentioned the accessibility and affordability of treatment to the underdeserved communities in India. Um, so yes, thank you so much for answering that. And uh, moving on to the uh, surgical part and uh, the treatment part of it, uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Ramnan have mentioned that, you know, in the uh, interior part of uh, when the cancer is in the interior part, we require surgery. So do all these uh, type of cancers, all uh, uh, sort of head and neck cancers require surgery? So... <clears throat> Uh, surgery is one of the mainstays of treatment of uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And the most common uh, site of head and neck cancer in India, I mean site means among all the other uh, type of head and neck cancers which we discussed, is the oral cavity cancer. And that is because of the chewing habit uh, which causes oral cavity cancer. So any cancer of the tongue or the oral cavity or the lip, if it is operable, if it comes in a situation where surgery is possible, that is the cornerstone of therapy. Having said that, there are many newer developments. We all we heard about uh, the immunotherapy being mentioned by uh, uh, mentioned in the talk. So there are newer treatments, and I would say that uh, the treatment of all cancers and head and and head and neck cancer being no exception is evolving a lot. The the era of uh, removing everything or radical surgeries is uh, is becoming less and less and it is the era of conservation so hardly we look at uh, a situation where uh, a laryngeal cancer patient uh, goes for a primary surgery of the larynx we we try to preserve the larynx by some means or the other either by giving chemotherapy initially or immunotherapy or radiation with chemotherapy and things like that but uh, in one line if uh, for a common man to know one of the mainstays or the mainstay of treatment in early stage oral cavity, tongue and the uh, 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 part of head and neck uh, cancers, which are the more common ones, is surgery. And in all other areas, the aim will be to uh, preserve the organ and there uh, the combination of other, uh, other treatments in, uh, in different forms is what is, is given. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, you have very rightly mentioned uh, that, you know, uh, uh, as we are advancing uh, into uh, this forefront of uh, uh, medicine, so surgery uh, is nowadays not, uh, uh, you know, uh, mainly required or, you know, preferred. So when I was also studying, we were taught that preservation of the natural organs of the body is the main, uh, you know, uh, aim of the, the treatment should be, that should be. So thank you so much for, uh, you know, answering that. And moving on to the medical part of this uh, treatment, the chemotherapy uh, that uh, Dr. Ramanan has also mentioned uh, for the posterior uh, type of cancer. So, Dr. Reddy, what are the common chemotherapy, targeted therapy and immunotherapy agents used in the treatment of head and neck cancers? Are you there, Dr. Reddy? Yes. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, I am able to hear you now. Yes, uh, so coming, uh, sorry for the disturbance. Uh, I got your question. Uh, you are asking about me uh, about the medical part of uh, treatment of head and neck cancers. So um, uh, the treatment is has evolved a lot. Uh, previously, it used to be only uh, chemotherapy, and, uh, the, and the conventional chemotherapy would leave the patient with a lot of uh, side effects. Uh, now the treatment parts are uh, the treatment phase of uh, medical treatment of uh, uh, head and neck cancers has evolved to uh, include targeted therapies and uh, immunotherapy as well. We have uh, uh, targeted therapy agents like cetuximab, immunotherapy agents like pembrolizumab, nivolumab that has come up in uh, last uh, decade or so. And uh, they have revolutionized management of head and neck cancers, especially the advanced stages of head and neck cancers in terms of increasing um, the duration of disease control, increasing the quality of life of the patient, the tolerability of treatment, and all of these things. Uh, but having said that, most of these uh, treatments are 
still inaccessible to majority of our patients if you see head and neck cancer is a cancer of uh, the underprivileged section of our society almost 90% of these patients uh, will not be able to tolerate uh, I, i mean access um, um, the latest advances like uh, targeted therapy or immunotherapy so there is definitely inequality in uh, delivering of treatment despite these options being available Uh, so the only way to overcome this is to one is to diagnose them early and uh, treat them in early stages where you will not be requiring uh, these novel uh, costly molecules the second is to have our own uh, uh, research projects or uh, uh, as somebody has already mentioned one of our speakers have already mentioned india is the head and neck cancer capital of the world we have the largest burden of head and neck cancer so once we do more and more research in indian uh, uh, patients and in, uh, within our uh, community medical community and develop uh, treatment options which are uh, deliver- deliverable at a lesser cost to our patients in t- especially in terms of medical treatment we will be better served and more number of patients will be uh, um, i mean fit, um, benefited from uh, such advances so uh, even though the field has advanced and e- even though we have new molecules there is a gap of uh, access and uh, there is an inequality in that uh, uh, regard uh, thank you so much uh, dr reddy for uh, telling us the medical side of uh, uh, the molecules that are uh, used in the treatment of head and neck cancer uh, moving you have uh, told about the accessibility and affordability of life so dr uh, vadvas mam how does this treatment affect the quality of life of people yeah before there coming to the quality of life could i just accept that we missed talking about the symptoms i think you had asked me and i missed talking about the types so since we are here and we know that awareness plays a very important role in early detection of cancers it's very important for the uh, people for the general public to know as to how it manifests what are the ways in which one could you know uh, suspect that there is an issue and one should go and seek medical attention so if you permit i would lo- like to talk uh, for 2 minutes about the symptoms sure ma'am it's an awareness session so it will yes. <laughs> not Ms. be concluded uh, talking about signs and symptoms yes very true so see the head and neck cancers will present in variable ways but the most common symptom that we often see is a swelling or a sore or a ulcer uh, which does not heal for many many weeks so one should not neglect and seek medical advice the other very common symptom especially in those who use tobacco in chewable form could be a white patch or a red patch inside the mouth the symptom could also be a lump in the neck itself uh, another symptom could be a persistent uh, so called sore throat Uh, it could also be a foul uh, smell coming from the mouth despite the patient brushing the teeth twice uh, a day uh, when it's affecting the voice box the voice uh, character would change it would become heavier hoarse um, if it's arising from the nasopharynx as we know then it could present uh, with different types of you know uh, if the nerves get affected in uh, facial uh, deviation or nasal obstruction or persistent nasal congestion or frequent nose bleeds that could be another manifestation of head and neck cancers um, then a uh, patient could also present with some sort of difficulty in chewing or swallowing the patient may in fact report and you are a dentist so you would agree that the patient could present to you with loosening of teeth and when you examine such a patient uh, you may find a uh, growth sitting uh, in the alveolus under the teeth so or the patient may come to you uh, that the dentures are no longer fitting well so that's the time uh, to suspect you know um, being right. a dentist i'm sure you would agree with me that these are two you know peculiar ways in which patient could present uh, patient of head and neck cancer could present to a dentist like you right now right. coming to your uh, second question as to the effect of treatment on the quality of life now head and neck cancer is peculiar in that regard also because uh, the disease itself already affects the quality of life and then the treatment is such that you know surgery radiotherapy and also chemotherapy also affect the quality of life of all these patients and the quality of life gets affected for very prolonged periods of time 
so it's very important to keep that aspect of treatment also in mind. So this is a very important question. So head and neck cancer patients, they frequently report after treatment, you know, continued loss of uh, appetite, continued uh, difficulty in swallowing, uh, they continue to lose weight, and therefore they require continuous nutritional assessment and assistance, and they require dietary supplements and sometimes even feeding tubes for very long periods of time. Now pain, persistent pain, which could now result from uh, you know, treatments such as radiotherapy or even surgery, persistent pain is another important issue which affects their quality of life in a big, big way. It also affects the functioning and also affects their you know, psychological status or their emotional status. Other very important aspect of their quality of life is speech problems or reduced mouth opening, um, you know, affecting the feeding. So another, that's another important issue that they face. They often report loss of taste and smell uh, post radiotherapy. Also dryness of mouth and sticky saliva, thickening of saliva is very common side effect of radiotherapy. Um, and because of the you know, extensive surgeries that may need to undergo, especially if it's a re-surgery, uh, they may have problems related to body image uh, also because uh, that may lead to uh, loss of confidence. So because of all these different quality of life parameters which get affected either initially by disease and subsequently by you know, the treatments that we use to treat head and neck cancers, these patients, they, they need our continuous attention, uh, continuous counseling, not only during treatment, but even after the treatment gets over, they need our you know, um, support, um, the uh, support in form of medicines, support in form of counseling sessions, uh, support in form of dietary advice, uh, and various other measures. So uh, that's a very important issue of treatment of head and neck cancer patients. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vadva. You have very insightfully mentioned all the presenting symptoms of uh, head and neck cancer. And sometimes, in majority of the times, the dentists are the one who, uh, you know, uh, can figure out uh, these signs and symptoms. Just like in the oral cavity, you have mentioned uh, different colored patches that are there, loosening of denture or tightening of dentures or loosening of teeth uh, in the cavity. And um, you have also uh, mentioned uh, uh, regarding the quality of life after the treatment, I would uh, want to add one more point there, uh, that apart from the physical symptoms that they are suffering from, there are emotional and psychological symptoms are also a part of it. It, uh, uh, regarding the financial aspect of the treatment or uh, the kind of sufferings, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are uh, uh, being uh, uh, so the type, the kind of uh, uh, you know treatment for the treatment, uh, the kind of sufferings that they are uh, going through. So, so that is the one point that I wanted to add in this. And uh, so we have talked about the quality of life. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramnan, what are the chances of survival in head and neck cancer? And what is the rate of reoccurrence in these type of cancers? Like, like any cancer, uh, early stage one and stage two cancer, obviously a good majority up of 70, 80, even 90 percent will be cured. But even in a developed country, a uh, lot of these cancers present in advanced stage. So in our country, majority would present in advanced stage. So once they are stage three, obviously we have only around 30%, 35% long-term survivorship. So the key is what uh, Dr. Uruvasi said. We need to get them in early uh, screening, and uh, what Dr. Jyoti said, the whole community should be aware about all these simple, small, small, innocuous symptoms, which actually could protect a head and neck cancer. So early cancer, very high cure rates. Advanced cancers, cure rates only around 30%. Recurrence, obviously, even after good treatment, a percentage of patients will recur. And uh, important thing would be that if there is a risk factor like smoking or alcohol, that has to be 100% stopped. And because the same mucosa is there in all over the head and neck place, 
and if the inciting uh, carcinogen is still available, a uh, good probability to develop another cancer in the same area is there. And because of smoking, etc., uh, that individual could develop cancer somewhere else, like the foot pipe or in the lungs. So recurrence is always a threat, which we need to be aware, commonly within the first two to three years. So they need to be under follow-up at least for five years. And we need to ensure that there is a definite lifestyle, a lifestyle change. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Namunan, for uh, giving us insights on the reoccurrence and uh, the surviving, uh, uh, you know, chances of survival in head and neck cancers. Uh, moving on to the treatment and post-treatment completion, uh, Dr. Prasad, I would like to ask you, sir, what care should be taken during the treatment and post-treatment completion in head and neck cancer patients? So we heard from Dr. Jyoti that uh, the treatment is not easy. Treatment can give side effects actually, especially uh, when there is a post-surgery post that can be a difficulty in speech and swallowing. So speech and swallowing therapy is a key part of rehabilitation of patients during and after surgery. This is also one important factor which is mostly ignored in head and neck cancer and in many other cancers is the nutritional status of the patient which can deteriorate during these treatments. And when we talk about other treatments, sometimes we may have to give radiation after surgery or radiation might be the mainstay of treatment along with chemotherapy. So during this period, there can be uh, side effects like dryness of mouth, there can be mucositis, there can be infection, there can be low blood counts because of uh, combination of chemotherapy and radiation. So it, it, is, uh, they, it is important to take the patient through the treatment. As Dr. Ramanan said, uh, even after the best of treatments, a major, a, 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 some patients will recur. And the key thing is to keep the uh, treatment as effective as possible. And supportive care uh, is one of the most important stays uh, which helps, to, uh, helps the patients to go through these treatments. So during treatment, the key things to see will be that the patient is taken care, the nutrition is taken care, the speech is taken care, the swallowing is taken care, and post-treatment follow-up is very important, depending upon what uh, risk the patient uh, presented with. If it is a high-risk patient, maybe a slightly higher, uh, I mean, more frequent follow-ups and more frequent imagings, even though we say that there can be subtle signs which say that this is progression of disease, there are some signs, some patients who progress, uh, uh, who may not have any symptoms. So uh, patients who are at high risk of recurrence may need a imaging, like a post-treatment PET scan at a particular point of time to detect distant metastasis. So during treatment, it is the supportive treatment, which is important to take the patient through the treatment. And post-treatment, we should look for long-term sequelae of treatments, which can again be speech and swallowing and uh, nutrition, and also uh, always have an eye for the uh, recurrence of disease. So it is important for having uh, follow-ups at regular intervals. Uh, another thing, as Dr. Revenant said, is to make sure that the lifestyle is uh, is uh, changes are uh, happening. Patients should be told very clearly that continuing the habits of smoking and alcohol actually will definitely put them at a higher risk of recurrence. and. Head and neck cancer is one cancer where we talk about field cancerization. A patient may have cancer of one part of the head and neck which got treated, but they may develop, a, a, come back with cancer in another site. And that is because they of field cancerization, which increases if the patient continues the primary habit. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasad, for walking us through the type of care that is needed uh, before the treatment, uh, during the treatment and post-treatment. And, um, and now moving on to the public-private partnership, uh, uh, the role of public-private partnership, uh, Ms. Urvashi, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, ma'am, what role do you see for public-private partnership in addressing the challenge of head and neck cancer in India? Yeah, I think, um, you know, anything actually in healthcare, not just head and neck cancer, but um, any healthcare challenge uh, in a country like ours can only be tackled through uh, a public-private uh, 
a joint effort. Um, but but really, uh, in this case, uh, I think there are some uh, avenues you know, for collaboration. Uh, one is, I think, on the research side, uh, we constantly need to come up with uh, better diagnostics, better treatment options. Uh, so that is something where research can play a very big role because not only better, but also more efficient. Uh, because anything in a country like India, we have to do at tremendous scale. Uh, and so it has to be a very cost effective option uh, if we have to scale it up and we have to make it accessible for, uh, you know, the common person, the average citizen. Uh, so I think research is one very, very important avenue uh, and, and especially coming up with, you know, treat, better treatment options, more cost effective options. I think that is a very, very important area uh, of collaboration. Um, but also, I think in general, you know, awareness creation, it's not something that the government can do alone. Uh, obviously, the government has a very big role to play in creating this awareness. Um, but even the private sector, because so many patients actually go to the private sector, um, there is a big opportunity uh, for private players to create awareness uh, about head and neck cancers, right from the prevention aspects to, uh, as we discussed on the panel, how do you uh, quickly identify if something seems to be going wrong uh, so that you can take corrective measures uh, in a timely manner. Uh, so that is another uh, avenue where I think um, there is a lot of opportunity working together and for partnering. Uh, and also in access to treatment, you know, like I, I spoke of the government uh, insurance programs and of course, you know, we have to constantly improve these programs and we have to try and bring in newer and better treatments into their ambit. Uh, but here also, you know, the private sector can play its role in driving costs down um, and making sure that we can actually uh, reach out to as many patients as possible, you know, because when we are talking of these conditions, uh, we are not just talking of, you know, urban centers, we are not just talking of a few large cities, uh, we are talking of the whole of India where, you know, there are so many rural, remote, tribal uh, populations. Um, where these services are actually not, uh, you know, reaching uh, as well as they should. So I think there also uh, we have a very, very big opportunity for this kind of um, collaboration. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Urushi. You have rightly mentioned that through collaboration only, uh, we can provide accessible and affordable treatment uh, to the patients, uh, uh, no matter what the disease is. Um, and uh, also, I have a few questions from the audience as well. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, would you like to answer one of these questions, sir? Sure. So, uh, one question is regarding the hereditary connection between the head and neck cancer, sir. Uh, so, is head and neck cancer uh, can be, uh, you know, is a hereditary or is there a genetic predisposition to this type of cancer? Uh, I would say it's a, it's not a very common uh, thing to have hereditary predisposition to adenoid cancer. As I told, most of the adenoid cancers are uh, uh, lifestyle related, but a small percentage of uh, hereditary cancers uh, are seen, and adenoid cancer is no exception. So, basically, if uh, there are, there are two kinds of genes in the body, uh, one group of genes called tumor suppressor genes, who actually uh, make sure that tumors don't grow in the body. So that there, there can be certain situations where there can be an issue with the tumor suppressor genes in the body where hereditary cancers can happen. And in those patients, sometimes head and neck cancer is seen as part of that. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, Dr. Reddy, um, there is one more question on uh, the age group. So, uh, so what is the age group of these uh, uh, head and neck cancers? Uh, which can occur in what age it can occur or uh, head and neck cancer also can occur in general ch uh, children as well okay the typical age group for uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is uh, around 30 to 60 years of age um, where uh, supposedly uh, these are mostly related to tobacco exposure so uh, usual age of starting tobacco is in uh, second to third decade and after about uh, 10 to 15 years of continuous tobacco exposure these cancers develop. So 30 to 60 years is the common age group that we see the maximum number of uh, uh, cases of such cancers. Mm, whether they can occur in a younger age group, like less than 20 years in children, 
yes but uh, not head and neck squamous cell carcinomas uh, we can have uh, thyroid cancers which can occur anywhere uh, in less than 10 years also less than 15 20 years also uh, we can have uh, specific pediatric cancers that can occur in head and neck region uh, in uh, childhood age group uh, like rhabdomyosarcomas um, uh, uh, yeah, lymphoma can occur in uh, uh, neuroblastoma can or factory neuroblastoma can occur so these are not head and neck squamous cell carcinomas that we discussed so so far uh, specifically related to tobacco these are other cancers uh, that are part of head and neck region but uh, not squamous cell carcinomas so they can indeed occur in these age groups but the common area age group for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is uh, the third fourth fifth and sixth decades Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reddy. Um, Dr. Ramnan, uh, there is uh, one question on the lifestyle changes that you have uh, uh, talked about previously. So apart from alcohol and tobacco, what are the lifestyle changes that can be made to uh, prevent these uh, type of cancers? I wouldn't say specific to head and neck cancer. Those two are very specific to head and neck cancer. But any cancer in general obviously we need to exercise regularly so that is a key point at least 30 minutes every day and our diet should have fruits and vegetable so these two things and also somewhere hpv has been mentioned so we need to have some safe sexual practices are also important because there is also a change in uh, the sexual practices that can also result in uh, oropharyngeal cancers so this would thank be my thoughts so yeah thank you so much dr ramnan uh, dr vadva there is one question on pregnancy uh, so if a mother is having head and neck cancer or squamous cell cancer can is uh, can it pass through uh, the placenta and can happen in the child as well no uh, it normally doesn't happen that way uh you know uh, it's it depends you know how uh, spread out it is but uh, the squamous cell cancer cells i'm sure a pregnant lady with that uh, would be able to get it detected uh, soon enough and it doesn't get secreted into the breast milk per se so breast feeding is safe uh, the uh, transmission uh, usually does not occur through placenta also to the child so child is safe the in utero child is also safe Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vadva. So, with this, uh, I would like to conclude this uh, wonderful discussion that we had today. So, I would like to thank you, all the panelists, uh, all the esteemed panelists, for taking time for this important panel discussion today. So, this discussion has been very informative and uh, has provided valuable insight into this uh, critical issue. So, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vadva, Dr. Narayan, and uh, Dr. Ramnan, Dr. Reddy. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.